Hi, my name is Brooks Cash. I am uh, the Dan and Lily Sterling Professor of Medicine and Division Chief of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston at the Houston Texas Medical Center. And it's my privilege to be able to give you an introduction today on diarrhea. Now, in terms of diarrhea, this can mean many things to many people. So what patients will typically describe as diarrhea are loose stools or increased stool frequency or both or a sense of fecal urgency. It's important for clinicians to actually ask patients what they mean by the term diarrhea. And usually, as I mentioned, it, it implies looser or watery stool, but there are some patients who actually do equate the increase in frequency, even if they're having normal stool form as diarrhea. And that's really not, that's something that we call pseudo diarrhea. And this is a very common condition diarrhea is. Acute diarrhea accounts for about 180 million cases per year in the US and chronic diarrhea is a little less uh, known in terms of its prevalence, but it's thought to uh, be present in about one to 5% of the population in developed countries. So important topics. Now, in terms of how we define diarrhea, it is based on the Bristol stool form scale. Uh, I often will consider type five along with diarrhea. Classically, it's type six and type seven. This is a, a way that patients and clinicians can characterize the water content of stool. And it goes all the way from the classic skibbolus or rabbit pellet-like stools and, and hard lumpy stools, type one and two, those are constipated stools, three through five considered normal. As I mentioned, five uh, can asso be associated with some diarrhea as well, and then six and seven with diarrhea. Now we have a couple of classifications of diarrhea. And when we talk to patients about this and even to each other as clinicians, this really sets the tone in terms of our of our nomenclature. So acute diarrhea is diarrhea that lasts less than two weeks. And that almost always is infectious, whether it's viral or bacterial, usually run its, runs its course and goes away as the body fights off the infection. Persistent diarrhea is greater than 14 days, but less than four weeks. And then chronic diarrhea is greater than four weeks. Now, persistent diarrhea is most often also infectious, although non-infectious causes can certainly play a role there. And then chronic diarrhea is mostly non-infection. Uh, non infectious diarrhea rarely lasts more than four weeks. There can be some, uh, specifically things like uh, Giardia or Clostridium difficile. And I also had a fourth category there. This is intermittent diarrhea. This is diarrhea that comes and goes uh, with asymptomatic intervals. This could be infection. It could also be consistent with irritable bowel syndrome with either diarrhea or a mixed IBS pattern. So uh, a little tougher to tease out. Now there's other ways that we can characterize diarrhea. It's not just the symptoms of increasing frequency uh, and decreasing stool consistency but also stool weight. And by definition, the criteria for uh, diarrhea in terms of increasing uh, fecal output is more than 200 grams per 24 hours. Uh, and that equates to at least 200 mLs of water for 24 hours. A very broad differential diagnosis exists for diarrhea. You know, most people want to blame their diarrhea on their diet, and sometimes that can play a role. Excessive caffeine, excessive fiber, excessive alcohol, all of those things can be associated with diarrhea. The malabsorption or maldigestion of sugars, such as lactose or sucrose, uh, as well as starches, can play a role. Maldigestion of celiac, uh, or I'm sorry, of gluten can play a role. Uh, that's commonly seen in celiac disease. So, you know, lots of different causes. Some are very benign, some are more serious. Crohn's disease, um, chronic pancreatic insufficiency. So things like that. And so this is not meant to be an all-inclusive list, but these are the things that should be going through clinicians' heads uh, and thoughts when they are confronted with a patient with chronic diarrhea. Now, I wanna come back to a couple of different classifications. What I'll typically do in, in my practice and I encourage my trainees to do this, is try and determine whether or not patients are having secretory diarrhea or osmotic diarrhea. Osmotic diarrhea gets better when people don't take in food. It's still taking uh, fluid, but not food. 
And the whole concept here is that there is an osmotic gradient. There's a solute in the gut that's trapping water, or actually bringing water in and leading to the diarrhea. So if you eliminate those solutes, and an example of this would be like lactose maldigestion or uh, perhaps celiac disease would be another one, or uh, maldigestion of sucrose. Uh, all of those will get broken down by bacteria in our gut, those sugars and carbohydrates and proteins. That can lead to some inflammation microscopically, but more importantly, the creation of a high osmotic gradient, which traps water, almost like a bowel prep would do. And that's why people get uh, diarrhea with an osmotic diarrhea. Now that's to contrast that, moving to the left of the slide, with what's called a secretory diarrhea. This, an example of this would be something like cholera. You can have a patient fast or, or starve them for a day and they will continue to have diarrhea because they're actively secreting fluid into the GI tract. This is most commonly seen with infection and very rarely some um, tumors that can secrete uh, hormones that lead to active secretion, but also ingestion of laxatives and uh, other things. It's one of the basis of our laxative therapy for constipation. Now, another classification, which is a little bit more intuitive, would be trying to figure out whether the diarrhea is inflammatory or non-inflammatory. Non-inflammatory pretty much speaks for itself. There's an absence of blood, there's no uh, fevers, um, you know, no uh, fecal leukocytes when we look under the microscope, which is a test that we don't do that much anymore, but not, not a, a huge uh, urgency or feeling like patients have to go all the time. Whereas inflammatory diarrhea, there's gonna be blood and mucus in the stool, fevers, uh, a high degree of tenesmus, having that, that sense of having to go all the time, abdominal pain. It's usually small volume, frequent bowel movements. Dehydration is not typical with inflammatory diarrhea. Uh, and then when we take biopsies or look with an endoscopy, the uh, lining of the colon is often inflamed or abnormal. Now, most patients with chronic diarrhea, greater than four weeks in duration, are going to end up having what's called functional diarrhea. Some of these patients may have irritable bowel syndrome if abdominal pain is present. Another large group of patients has this condition, functional diarrhea. And it's defined simply as loose or watery stools without abdominal pain or bothersome bloating at least 25% of the time with defecation. And there's some criteria that are you know, listed here in terms of how long patients should have symptoms. But this would be the majority of people who show up with chronic diarrhea. It's either irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea or a mixed pattern of, of irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea and constipation, or perhaps functional diarrhea. That being said, because of the very broad differential diagnosis of diarrhea, we do end up doing a pretty extensive uh, diagnostic evaluation in these patients. In terms of evaluation, we absolutely want to take a good dietary history. We want to make sure that patients are, are meet that minimal criteria for, for diarrhea. We want to ask them what their diarrhea symptoms are. There are some alarm features that we ask about, unintentional weight loss, a family history of gastrointestinal disease, recent travel, recent antibiotic use, um, physical exam that may show something. If we find those alarm features, those patients should have a more directed, more in-depth diagnostic evaluation. This is a very busy slide, but this is what the Rome Committee recommends uh, be the part of the process with regards to diagnosing patients with chronic diarrhea. And it goes over many of the things I've just said. There are some diagnostic tests that are listed here. And these diagnostic tests are designed to look for inflammation in the, in the GI tract, to assess for anemia, to test the thyroid function, to uh, look for infection in the gut, um, there are some other tests that are listed that we may end up doing that are uh, suggested, but not necessarily uh, the law of the land. Most of the time, these will be normal, and we will end up treating patients empirically, which simply means that we try them on anti-diarrheal agents. And usually, that's to take the form of um, over-the-counter anti-diarrheal agents, but may actually end up being prescription therapies. We may end up doing colonoscopy in patients, especially if they're older and they have new onset diarrhea. That's a good excuse for us also to accomplish their colon cancer screening. If they have any markers suggesting organic disease, then more than likely we'll end up doing a colonoscopy with biopsies as well. But this, even though it looks a bit complicated, it is a relatively simple pathway that we should follow for patients with diarrhea. Now, if we move over and talk about the treatment, there's 
uh, a number of goals that we have. We want to improve stool consistency. We want to harden up the stool. That should give our patients uh, enough time to feel that stool burden and get to a, a toilet for it with a socially acceptable venue and uh, not have them have accidents. We want to reduce the stool frequency and we wanted to reduce the stool weight. And there's four major ways that the medications that we use for diarrhea work. They either slow down gastrointestinal motility or movement. They increase absorption of solutes and fluid from the GI tract into the blood of the body. Uh, they block intestinal secretion of fluid or inflammatory mediators, and they modify enteric contents. And the example of the last would be something like probiotics or perhaps even antibiotics. So they affect the bacterial environment of the gut. And there's a long list of therapies that we can use as anti-diarrheal drugs. What I've done with this list is I've highlighted the most commonly used and most widely accepted and studied therapies. Now, many of these are, some of these are FDA approved therapies for diarrhea, especially in the form of irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, some of these are over the counter therapies. So an example of opioid receptor agonists or modulators would include something like loperamide, which is modium, or diphenoxalate atropine, which is lamodal, or perhaps even eloxadiline, which is viberzi. The latter is a the last is an FDA approved therapy for IBS with diarrhea. A 5-HT3 receptor antagonist is uh, a serotonin type 3 antagonist. An example of that would be something like uh, Elocitron or Lotrinex, another FDA approved therapy for diarrhea. Most of the time, it's very appropriate to start with over-the-counter therapy. What I'll usually recommend my patients do if I haven't found a, a cause for their diarrhea is have them start on one or two Imodium every day, and then we'll ramp that up uh, and try to get control of their diarrhea. If they have abdominal pain, significant bloating, then I may use another agent along the lines of the FDA-approved therapies. So let me just bring it this home and, and summarize everything that we talked about. Diarrhea is very, very common. It has a substantial burden on patients with the condition, but also their caregivers and the healthcare system. It's important to classify and characterize the diarrhea. Is it acute or chronic? Is it persistent? Uh, is it an osmotic versus secretory form? Is it inflammatory versus non-inflammatory? We evaluate diarrhea by taking a good history, doing a good physical exam, and then using um, uh, cognitive and, and directed testing uh, when appropriate. First line therapies, diet modifications, lifestyle modifications, and over the counter therapies. The first two are more difficult and they're less successful, but they can help people. Changing your diet or changing your lifestyle can be very effective uh, for diarrhea in some people, but more often than not, we will end up having to use some form of therapy. Over the counter therapies with um, anti diarrheal drugs like uh, loperamide or Diphenoxalate atropine are very appropriate and then escalating to uh, FDA approved prescription therapies such as rifaximin, which is an antibiotic, eloxadiline, or elocitron is appropriate for many patients. And those do have the best clinical trial evidence. But as I said, there's many different ways to manage this. The key is to get patients to talk to us about it and recognize that there are effective therapies uh, for this condition. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, I look forward to, to hopefully seeing you again soon and being able to share more with regards to functional gastrointestinal disorders or disorders of gut-brain interaction. Thank you.